this lens needs no introduction. The Laowa 24mm Macro Probe lens has been on the market for a while now and it is arguably one of the most innovative lens I've ever seen. The unique thing about this lens is that it is a wide-angle macro, so it gives you a perspective that you are not able to replicate on other lenses. Take a look to see how different it is compared to a traditional macro lens and a regular 24mm lens. On top of that, its probe-like shape allows you to shoot through very tight spaces and its waterproof construction unlocks many shooting possibilities. However, I was at a shoot recently and using it for the first time, I found it to be quite a challenge. It could be due to its wide-angle macro nature or because of its narrow aperture. Either way, this lens wasn't exactly straightforward to use. So for this video, I'm going to use this lens extensively in a variety of situations to figure out what works best and what doesn't and I'll share them with you so you can eliminate all that trial and error. If you guys are new to the channel, do consider subscribing to show some support and for more of such content in the future. Hey guys, what's up? My name is Bernard and welcome to the channel. So for today's video, I'll be sharing with you guys the best ways to use the 24mm macro probe lens and some of the things that you might want to avoid slash prevent. For such a specialty lens, there is a high chance that you'll be renting it instead of purchasing it on your own. That means that you either won't have much time to experiment with this lens to see what works or you to spend extra money renting it for additional days to test it out. That's where this video comes in. After watching this, hopefully you can gain some insights on what to expect so you don't have to try figure it out all on your own. I would like to give a shout out to Cameron Rental Centre Singapore for making this video possible. They have very kindly loaned me this lens for me to make this tutorial. If you ever need this lens for your productions, do consider renting from them and using my discount code to save some money. I also want to take a moment to mention that they have refreshed their website. I must say, it looks much more aesthetic now and it is very user friendly. Anyways, back to the lens. Let's start experimenting and the first scenario is a studio setting. This is probably the scenario you'll be used in the most. The benefits of shooting in a studio setting is that you have much more control over the environment and more importantly, you have control of the light. Speaking of lights, the widest aperture of this lens is f14, which means it will require lots of light. I have a couple of lights at my disposal and hopefully it will be sufficient. For the first setup, we'll be doing a very basic two-point lighting setup with two of my most powerful lights. So if this doesn't work, this segment is pretty much finished. The probe lens is usually paired with a slider and that's what I'll be doing as well. I'm using both the YC Onion Chocolate SE Slider and the Rhino RV Pro. I've actually done a review about both these sliders before, so do check it out. Before I show you the successful shots, let me show you some of the mistakes I made so hopefully you can learn from them. Firstly, I manually controlled the slider with the physical buttons on it, which resulted in jitters in the footage. Secondly, because I placed the focus so close to the lens and at the bottom of the framing, throughout the movement, it looks like the shot is out of focus even though the final subject is in focus. After rearranging the set, the third mistake I made was to use a slider at its faster speed, which resulted in pretty obvious camera shake. My advice to you is to experiment which speed your slider can move at and still remain stable even with such an extreme close-up. With all those issues sorted out, here is how the final image looks. For this shot, I'm using the Godox VR150 paired with a 90cm parabolic softbox as a soft key light and the Aperture 60X as a hard backlight. To be honest, with the lighting setup I have for it now, it is still insufficient. I had to bump my ISO levels to 25,600 just to expose this scene correctly. And it's thanks to the A7S 3 slow light capabilities that this shot is still usable. If you want to use a soft key light for your shots, I would recommend you to use a light that is 300 watts and above. But let's say you only had 150 watt light at your disposal, can you still make it work? Let's now look at how it will look if you use the built-in light on the lens with the previous lighting setup. As the light from the lens is very harsh, I had to turn down the exposure and that results in the objects in the foreground being bright and the objects in the background being darker. I personally don't really like this look, but if it is what you're going for, this is a possible alternative. And this is how it will look if you use only the built-in light. 
As you can see, the background is even darker than before. One downside of using this light is that if the objects are reflective, it will show up in your shot just like how it is doing so now. So let's say you really dislike using the built-in lights. Fret not because there are other alternatives. One thing you could do is to use a smaller softbox. By using a 55cm softbox instead of a 90cm softbox, I managed to lower my ISO settings, but one can still argue that it is still relatively high. The fifth option is to use a reflector dish to increase the light output and to use a collapsible diffuser to soften it. This allows me to lower my ISO levels to 4000 and still have a fairly soft light hitting my subjects. However, at this point of time, the backlight is overpowered and barely visible anymore. If that still isn't enough light, you could remove the diffuser entirely. However, the backlight will essentially be non-existent and the shadows on your subject will be very harsh. If that is the image you're going for, this is a viable option. As for using the chocolate SE slider, I think that a travel length of 20cm is not really enough to bring out the full potential of this shot. Therefore, for the next shot, we'll be switching over to the ROV Pro. Additionally, we will add Pavo tubes into the mix to light up the scene. Although the Rhino slider has a much more ideal travel distance, this slider has more jerkiness even at slower speeds. I also noticed that the jerk at the end was much more apparent as compared to the beginning, which is why I shot it as a pullback shot instead of a push-in. My solution to these problems was to speed up the clip, reverse it, and apply warp stabilization to make it more usable. But this solution might not be applicable to all situations, so my recommendation is to get a slider more suited for the job. For the last shot, we'll be looking at shooting into tight spaces and when there isn't an option to use any other light sources. For example, in this scenario, we were shooting into a page of a book. This shot is being lit up with nothing but the light on the lens. I would say that the image is surprisingly pleasing and the effect is very cool. Before we end off this studio segment, I want to see if there are any other shot variants that will look good with this lens. One alternative to doing a dolly in is to do a trucking shot. As you can see, this type of movement looks equally good and it is definitely refreshing to see other types of shots instead of repeating the same thing over and over. What if you don't have a slider to do either a dolly in or a trucking shot? This time, we are going to lock the camera on a tripod and for movement, we will be placing the subject on a turntable. You are still able to get nice shots even without a slider, but I would still highly recommend you to use one with this lens so you can get a variety of shots. Now that we're done with the studio shots, let's take things outdoors to see under what circumstances this lens will be best used for. One of the things this lens is great for is for environmental shots. Environmental shots are slightly different from establishing shots. Establishing shots are usually wide shots to showcase the location. Environmental shots on the other hand are close-ups of details in a location to focus on texture and to set the mood or to tell a story for a scene. With the Lawa Probe Lens macro capabilities and 24mm focal length, not only will you get the details, you will be able to showcase more of the environment which can be a unique perspective. 
I believe that the examples shown provide a clear picture on why the probe lens is great for environmental shots. Another situation that I think this lens is perfect for is wildlife videography. This lens is obviously not for animals that are skittish or for animals that you have to keep your distance from. However, for animals that you somehow can get close to, this lens will get you shots that will blow your mind. However, as it is unlikely that you'll be using the lights that we use in the studio, you do have to make sure that it is bright and sunny out. In my experience, when it was cloudy or if I was shooting in the shade, I had to push my ISO levels quite a bit to expose the image properly. Alternatively, you can use the light at the front of the lens, but personally, I don't really like the effects of it because the lighting looks quite flat to me. To conclude this segment, the situations that you can use this lens for goes beyond my recommendations so far. All you have to do is unleash your creativity and let the lens do the rest of the work. I have covered where and when to use this lens. Let's now talk about the how. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that you can either use it with a slider or lock it off on a tripod. Let's now talk about using this lens handheld. Personally, I wouldn't recommend using this lens handheld if you're trying to get a macro shot. Although it is a wide focal length because you're shooting such close-ups, any small movements will be easily picked up and it might not look very flattering. Therefore, I would say that although you can get passable shots handheld, I would still recommend you to use it with some support if possible. To conclude this video, here are my thoughts on this lens. It is capable of capturing unique images that can be absolutely mind-blowing because of its special characteristics. However, this lens is not very versatile and you probably can't use it in a wide variety of situations. This lens also requires shooting conditions to be perfect to produce stunning images. Otherwise, your images can look quite terrible. One thing to take note of is to ensure that you have enough light to expose the scene correctly. I would recommend using a 300 watt light and above and to use a camera with good low light performance. Another thing is to ensure that you have equipment to help you get smooth and stable shots. I would recommend using either a tripod or a slider to help you achieve that. Other than that, you just need an eye for details to help you spot opportunities to use this lens. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and found it useful. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you did. That's it for today, it's a wrap!